Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webcast. It's all in your head. It is Saturday, July the 9th, and we will be talking about epilepsy and seizure disorders. I'm sure many of you recognize me by now. I'm Rita, the moderator. And before you hear from Dr. Swingle, I'd like to tell you a little bit about his background. Dr. Swingle was titular full professor of psychology at the University of Ottawa prior to moving to Vancouver. A fellow of the Canadian Psychological Association, Dr. Swingle was lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, attending psychologist at McLean's Hospital, where he also was coordinator of the Clinical Psychophysiology Service. Dr. Swingle is registered psychologist in British Columbia, certified in biofeedback and neurotherapy. His newest book, Biofeedback for the Brain, was published by Rutgers University Press. The book is available at www.soundhealthproducts.com. Again, that is soundhealthproducts.com. If you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to send them over through the chat feature that you can see on your control panel. We will have two breaks today, and these breaks are designed for Dr. Swingle to answer anything you would like to know. So take the advantage of that. Okay, I think we are ready to roll. So welcome, Dr. Swingle, and good morning. Good morning. Okay, so let's... And this show on the road. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about seizure disorders, <clears throat> epilepsy and seizure disorders. And <clears throat> the first thing that we want to uh, go through here is <clears throat> uh, some of the important issues associated with, uh, with treating epilepsy. The first thing I want to point out is that when somebody comes in with a seizure disorder, epilepsy, for example, the first thing we do is a full QEEG. What that is, is a full head electroencephalogram. And I'll show you what characteristic patterns look like uh, associated with epilepsy, for example. Uh, we're going to be talking, uh, I'll go over some of the uh, issues associated with uh, common uh, epilepsy. But what I want to do today is I want to focus on some of the other seizure disorders that are associated with uh, uh, epilepsy and the relationship <laughs> epilepsy has with uh, other conditions like autistic spectrum disorder. Uh, the issues associated with pseudo-seizure disorders, absence seizures, and some medication effects, which is one of the major issues we have with uh, uh, problems with children that have uh, seizure disorders. The anti-seizure medications can have very serious uh, effects on developmental, uh, the uh, developmental of child <clears throat> causing developmental delays. And I want to go over some of the really uh, exciting uh, developments in neurotherapy in which we're able to use, uh, do brain work on very, very young infants, uh, uh, children who cannot participate volitionally in the traditional uh, brainwave biofeedback procedures. Uh, and these are the procedures referred to as brain driving. And I'll show you a couple of cases in which we've treated infants of four and five months of age, which is a major breakthrough in our ability to deal with some of these situations very early on in development. And this is what typically what we see in, uh, in uh, common uh, epilepsy. Uh, this is a topographical map of the full head uh, when we're doing full CAP EEGs. And uh, what this is showing is the distribution of, uh, in this case, two cycles a second. <clears throat> uh, and the colors represent how strong that waveform is. So in this particular case, what we're seeing here is over on the left side of the scale, two cycles a second is very strong. Uh, you can see the red and oranges are <clears throat> when it's uh, when the waveform is very high, very strong, high amplitude, and the uh, blues and uh, dark uh, blues are <clears throat> when there's 
very low levels or deficiencies. Now, this is compared with a normative database. So, what we traditionally find in conditions of <clears throat> uh, epilepsy is we find elevated theta activity up over the sensory motor cortex, which is uh, an area of the brain that runs right from one side or the other, from ear to ear roughly, right across the top of the head. And that's the area associated with sensation, perception, motor movements, and so forth. Now, the first thing that we find is elevated slow frequency in that region, and we find a deficiency in the uh, what's referred to as the sensory motor rhythm. Now, we're going to hear a lot today about the sensory motor rhythm. Sensory motor rhythm you only find over the sensory motor cortex, and it is a waveform that runs well, roughly from 9 hertz up to 13. We traditionally work in the arena of 11 to 13 cycles a second. Uh, and so, and you can see that the, there are pretty dark blues associated with that waveform and has some uh, yellows and uh, oranges and reds associated with the other one. So we want the slow frequency down and we want the sensory motor rhythm to come up. That's the standard treatment for, uh, for epilepsy. And here's just another case uh, in which you can see uh, and pretty substantial elevation of theta amplitude running across that region of the brain and deficiency in the sensory motor rhythm. So that's where that treatment of decreasing slow frequency and increasing the sensory motor rhythm uh, came as the treatment for common forms of, of epilepsy. Now it's interesting <clears throat> Uh, this is one of the first applications of neurotherapy in the treatment of serious conditions. And this goes back about almost four decades. And it was discovered, like other great discoveries, it was discovered quite by accident. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Barry Sturman, who was at UCLA Medical School, <clears throat> one of the adjunctive uh, programs in the Veterans Administration, uh, was doing work with cats in which he was trying to demonstrate that cats could be trained to increase the sensory motor rhythm. And he had a protocol that he was using to demonstrate, <clears throat> demonstrate that. And then he got a contract with the United States Air Force <clears throat> to uh, determine the seizure potential <clears throat> and some of the uh, seizure properties associated with rocket fuel. And uh, he was uh, doing a pilot uh, study, uh, trying to figure out how he was going to uh, study some of this. And he used some of the cats that he had used in the previous study in terms of trying to increase the sensory motor rhythm. And what he found was that some of the cats were pretty resistant to the hydrazine, which is uh, the, the uh, seizure producing uh, compound in rocket fuel. And the, it turned out that the cats that had the higher seizure threshold, that is, were more resistant to seizures, were the ones who had learned how to increase the sensory motor rhythm. So bingo, we had a treatment for epilepsy. <clears throat> this is what epileptiform, as it's called, activity looks like <clears throat> in a brain map. And uh, the epileptic uh, activity tends to be roughly in the, in the alpha range. Uh, and here you can see it distributed here. There's a large, there's a major association between epilepsy and uh, uh, autism. And this is a uh, <clears throat> book uh, written by Arlene Martel. <clears throat> called Getting Adam Back. Uh, Adam had auto and epilepsy. And she describes in one of the chapters in her book, Neurotherapy and her experience with uh, uh, the very 
profound uh, benefit that uh, Adam got from neurotherapy in terms of uh, immediately uh, decreasing the seizure uh, activity that he had and, and then treatment for, for autism. <clears throat> this was uh, written up in the Peace Arch News <clears throat> fairly recently, actually. Okay, now we're going to be talking about different waveforms, and for those folks who don't know what a brain wave looks like, <clears throat> some of them are very slow, like delta. Delta is around two cycles a second, <clears throat> and they're very slow waves in the brain. Now, the significance of a brain wave often depends on where in the brain you're looking. So, for example, some areas of the brain, like the back of the brain, you want to see a lot of slow activity, like theta activity. Theta are brain waves from three to seven cycles a second. And uh, high levels of theta activity in the back of the brain are associated with quiet and good sleep and so forth. On the other hand, if we see elevated too much theta in other areas of the brain, like in those brain uh, topographical maps I just showed you, that can be problematic because uh, it can indicate that an area of the brain is hypoactive or <laughs> that it's damaged in some way. For example, if somebody comes in with a stroke, we look around for a lot of theta where it doesn't belong. <laughs> Alpha, very rhythmic kind of waveform, 8 to 12 cycles a second, looks kind of like that. And beta is very fast activity, 16 to 25 cycles a second, and has this kind of look. Okay, now this is actual brainwave activity, uh, a recording, and let me just turn it on here. On the bottom of the screen, what you're looking at is what's called a spectral display, and the uh, waves on the left side of the scale are very slow frequency, two cycles a second. So here's down here, here's theta activity here, alpha activity. A sensory motor rhythm, if we're over the sensory motor cortex, that's where the sensory motor rhythm would be, and way on up to uh, 30, 40 cycles a second. The distribution should look something like this. That is, the lower frequencies should have stronger amplitude. And the formula that we, uh, we use is amplitude should inversely related to frequency. In other words, low frequency have higher amplitudes than fast frequencies. And this is what those brain waves actually look like. On the top, in the white, that's the raw signal. And then from that raw signal, you extract out the, the components that you're interested in. So here's your theta component. Uh, here's your alpha component. That is the one in purple. And then the uh, one in yellow are the higher frequencies. So this uh, particular brainwave uh, activity you know, looks fine. We're not seeing any peculiarities here. And this is generally what it should look like. Now, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about some common patterns that we see in uh, seizure disorders. Now, the first is we have a deficiency in slow frequency in the back of the brain, and I will explain in detail why that's important. But basically, it's associated with poor stress tolerance. Now, the, the next uh, ones are the ones we've just been discussing. Excessive slow frequency up over the sensory motor cortex, that's that theta amplitude. And you remember in the topographical maps I showed you, we had a lot of yellow and red activity over that region with somebody who had a seizure, who had epilepsy, actually. And the low sensory motor rhythm, and again, that's uh, those are brain waves in the 10 to 13 uh, range. And again, those were the areas in blue that I showed you, again, right over the sensory motor cortex, which is the strip right across the top center of the head. And that's 
measured in terms of the ratio of the slow frequency amplitude divided by the amplitude of the sensory motor rhythm. Another form, another uh, pattern that we're going to see is hyperactivity of a region in the front part of the brain referred to as the anterior cingulate gyrus. That's an area associated with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And uh, epileptiform spindles, those are the ones I just showed you uh, on, the, <clears throat> on the brain map. Now, one thing I think it's important to keep in mind, and that is Although we look for common patterns associated with seizure disorders, uh, it's important to, uh, to keep in mind that sometimes a treatment that we use for a condition is not necessarily the cause of the condition. That is, a deficiency in that the waveform may not be the cause. One of the better examples of that is <clears throat> aspirin may reduce a fever in a child, but the fever is not caused by a deficiency in aspirin. Similarly, we're very often able to markedly reduce involuntary movement seizures when we increase the sensory motor rhythm up over the sensory motor cortex, even though we're not seeing any particular evidence of a severe deficiency. So, what are we going over so far? First thing and the most critical is up over the sensory motor cortex. Again, that runs right across the top of the head, center, and, uh, ear to ear. So we find too much slow activity in there. Uh, and we find often a deficiency in the sensory motor rhythm. The second thing that we often find is a deficiency back in the back of the brain, and that is a deficiency of slow frequency relative to fast frequency amplitude. Now, in general, a deficiency in that area is associated with poor stress tolerance, predisposition to anxiety, problems with shutting the brain off, poor sleep quality often self-medicating behavior and often burn out, worn out feelings. In other words, it's the brain's area associated with quieting. Another aspect we often find in these conditions is, whoop, have it go around again, is hyperactivity of uh, the anterior cingulate gyrus I can't get to stop. In any event, that's an area that's right under this region right here. And in general, it's associated with obsessive compulsive uh, conditions. And in its milder case, we often get perseveration of, uh, of uh, intellectual and, and motor activities. Thank you, Dr. Swingle. This is our first break, and as I mentioned, we'll, we'll be addressing your questions. But before we do so, I'd like to let you know that we posted three of our previous It's All in Your Head webcast on our website. We have addiction, we have depression, and autism on there. In fact, let me show you how you can access these. I'm going to steal the screen from Dr. Swingle. Um, get it rather quickly or put myself in trouble here. Okay, and this is our website, uh, www.swingleandassociates.com. And what you need to do is go to our media page. And right on there, you would like, you want to go to our webcasts. And here they are, or listed. So this is where you can uh, watch the webcast that we did previously if you weren't able to uh, watch them. We'll be posting the one we did last time on fibromyalgia, and we'll be posting the one from today, probably be there in the next week or so. So you can just keep checking our media page. OK, let me give the screen back to Dr. Swingle. Okay, wonderful. Okay, 
So we have a first question here. Dr. Swingle, I have a student who I suspect has absent seizures. I mentioned this to the parents, but they do not want to hear this. If I did a quick you, would there be a way to pick this up so that they will be encouraged to get a full EEG? Emily used the neuro neurofeedback helmet that a family can use at home, but they did not see any changes. Thus, they are not open to doing neurofeedback. There are some markers associated with uh, with that condition, and basically, it's a marked elevation of the theta SMR ratio, uh, and though it's the one that I I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> However, uh, I feel very strongly that when you see something like uh, absence seizure or behavior associated with that, it's the behavior that you're concerned about. Now, we have a lot of children diagnosed with ADD, <clears throat> for example, whose problem is absence seizures. <clears throat> uh, the way I would proceed here is I would uh, simply point out to the uh, parent what it is you're observing. And what you're observing, <clears throat> excuse me, are conditions in which bringing the child out of a state of apparent daydreaming takes a lot longer than <clears throat> it would be the case if it was simply uh, daydreaming. <clears throat> uh, I would not try to uh, do a full assessment to persuade them that there's a behavioral problem with the child. <clears throat> That's really up to them. Thank you. My nephew has epilepsy and his seizures almost always happen at night. Is this unusual? No, it's not. Not at all. And the reason for that, uh, again, is something we spoke about earlier, where uh, uh, when you have increased slow frequency amplitude, that is when the strength of theta uh, is high, uh, seizure threshold decreases. And when a child is uh, in uh, early morning, theta uh, amplitude is high. And that's also true when they just get up in the morning. Their uh, uh, theta amplitude is high, so their seizure threshold is lower, <clears throat> meaning that uh, they're more easily triggered. Uh, one of the things that we use <clears throat> for that condition, by the way, is the omni harmonic. The Omni Harmonic, which we'll discuss a little later, what that does is suppress slow frequency amplitude. And a lot of parents who uh, have this issue uh, will turn on the uh, Omni Harmonic, the Omni Sound, as soon as the child, well, prior to waking the child. <clears throat> and that has the effect of suppressing theta amplitude, so it increases uh, seizure threshold during that period of vulnerability. Okay, thank you, Dr. Swingo, and we can move on. Okay. <clears throat> this is a, a case of a child with a seizure disorder and autism, 11 years of age. And uh, this is what the, the brainwave activity looks like. Uh, the elevated slow frequency and deficient uh, uh, low levels of sensory motor rhythm up over the sensory motor cortex. Now, right on top of the head is where this was measured. And that theta SMR ratio, 6.13, we want it below about three or so. So, this is telling us A, what the, uh, the causative factor likely is associated with the seizure, but uh, more importantly, where we can go to. Uh, uh, to improve it and by decreasing theta amplitude and increasing sensory motor rhythm. Uh, there's also that elevation of the anterior cingulate gyrus that I talked about before. And that we often find in autism. That's the, the perseverative behavior that these children often show. They get fixated on something. It could be anything. It could be uh, microwave ovens, and that's all they think about for weeks on end. 
Okay. <clears throat> this uh, child had multiple seizure medications, seizure frequency, uh, <clears throat> two to uh, seven uh, days per month, and developmental delays, many of them caused by the seizure medications themselves. This, uh, the anti-seizure medication effects, and these are what are problematic. And what happens is you get an increase in slow frequency amplitude in the front part of the brain. And you get a, a problem associated with what's called the alpha peak frequency, which is a, a measure of IQ. That is, a, I'm sorry, not a measure of IQ. It correlates with IQ. <clears throat> uh, and the larger that number, the less efficient the brain. And what we find with uh, anti-seizure medications, the reason that they work is they slow things down. And it slows down the frontal cortex, and it slows down the brain efficiency. And that's the developmental delay that you often get with anti-seizure medications. And this is a case of a nine-month-old male child <clears throat> uh, who had West syndrome, which is an infantile seizure disorder. Uh, it can be very problematic. It can be progressive. It can be fatal. <clears throat> uh, these folks flew in, so uh, we had uh, intensive treatments, several treatments a day, and they stayed for three months, well, not quite three months with us. Uh, when the child came in, now this is the advantage of brain driving because a child of nine months would not be able to participate in brainwave biofeedback. Uh, but we can do brain driving here. Uh, the theta SMR ratio, the one we've been talking about now, the, we want the, the intensity of the theta divided by the intensity of sensory motor rhythm. It was above 10 uh, at all locations over the sensory motor strip. We want it below 3 or so. <coughs> uh, and what we did was uh, uh, decrease seizure three. Uh, sorry, decrease theta amplitude, increase sensory motor rhythm. Uh, this was the average uh, post treatment, so about half what it was when he began. And his best uh, theta SMR ratios uh, that we could get for several minutes at a time was sitting around three. So we gave the uh, parents something that they could do at home to sustain the uh, the gains and get further improvements. And that was referred to as the EFT technique, which I'll describe a little later. Now, this is what the course of uh, treatment looked like. When the child, when we started with the child, uh, the child had no seizure-free days, so seizures every day. After four weeks of treatment, 45% of the days were seizure-free. Free. Eight weeks, 57%, 10 weeks, 87% seizure-free days. And at during week 11, he achieved 100% seizure-free days during that period of time. Uh, it came down off the medications, and these folks went back home with a home treatment procedure. <clears throat> This is a uh, heart-wrenching uh, case. This is a, an infant with the, uh, genetic degenerative brain disorder, a fatal condition, progressively, uh, uh, progressively more severe until the child dies. Problem is infantile s uh, spasms associated with that. And what the parent wanted was they wanted to be be able to uh, have the, tr uh, the child off of uh, uh, medications, re reduce or eliminate the, uh, the seizures, <clears throat> and so that the child would be more alert so that they could have a relationship with the child uh, during the time that the child was alive, as opposed to being heavily sedated in which the child would simply be sleeping or in a heavily sedated form. Uh, uh, condition. Uh, the theta SMR ratios was sitting at around 6.2. Uh, 
uh, had multiple seizures daily, limited use of his arms. Uh, we did a lot of work uh, with this child, and, and the, the uh, brain driving that we used was we have a vibrating bear, and that is, <clears throat> this is a teddy bear that's set up with a vibrator in it, and when the brain is doing what we want it to do, the bear vibrates, and the child just hugs the bear. Uh, we also have a harmonic referred to as Mozart, <clears throat> and what Mozart does is Mozart increases the sensory motor rhythm. So that was tied directly to the brainwave uh, measurements during the brain driving. And when the <clears throat> uh, theta SMR ratio went above threshold, training threshold, this would come on to drive the SMR up uh, and the uh, theta down. So this just shows you session one, how rapidly we can get change when you're using aggressive brain driving procedures. He started at uh, 6.2, and at the end of the treatment, he was down to 4.28, 31% change. They stayed with us for a while, and post-treatment, the mother reported that the child was alert, had many seizure-free days, regained partial use of the arms, and he died 16 months after treatment. Okay, so brain driving. This is a, the, uh, the way it looks uh, with an adult. So we have headsets, so we can present auditory stimulation. <clears throat> We have goggles, so we can present the uh, light stimulation. He's got electrodes on his arm, so uh, in adults we use uh, electrical stimulation. And stimulation at this point, which is referred to as pericardium 6 in acupuncture, uh, that increases slow frequency in the back of the brain. So the person has control of the intensity of the sound and the intensity of the light that they adjust them to comfortable areas. And we're able to present stimulation, light, sound, microamperage stimulation, and so forth, based on what the brain is doing. So it's a very, very aggressive, and uh, very efficient treatment. And obviously, we can use this with uh, uh, anybody in uh, seriously demented uh, elderly, for example, who uh, can't participate in brainwave biofeedback. Uh, we can do this because it's a non-volitional uh, protocol. Now, the harmonic that uh, I was talking about <clears throat> referred to as Omni, and Omni suppresses elevated slow frequency. It suppresses theta. We use it instead of Ritalin for kids that have AD and so forth. Now, this is not a seizure condition. This is a condition of hyperactivity, ADHD. And I just want to show you uh, what this looks like. So here is the elevated slow frequency. And this is what's causing the hyperactivity in the child. And what we want to do is we want to suppress that. Now, we can do that with neurotherapy or, or and, I should say, we can add, uh, have the uh, child use the omniharmonic because this is what the omniharmonic does. This uh, uh, has, uh, uh, this was uh, data provided to us by Dr. Budzinski. And what it is is a sample of what happens to the brain after exposure to the omniharmonic. Here's all your slow frequency. There's your theta frequencies. And you can see it suppressed it, uh, minus 32 percent, uh, minus 23 percent. All of them are 10 percent or higher suppression. Fast alpha and up into the sensory motor rhythm uh, arena, we get a nice increase in activity, okay? So uh, the use of this in the home environment, in addition to using this in brain driving, can be extraordinarily effective. We always test anything we use before we use it. Now, this is just the raw data associated with 
an, a, an intake assessment, a brainwave assessment that I do on somebody. And here, this is theta now. This is the strength or amplitude of theta. And we're measuring it at CZ, which is right on top of the head, right over the sensory motor cortex. And here's where I put on the omniharmonic. I just played it in the background. And you can see an instant decrease in the amplitude of theta. And in this case, the decrease was 21%. Sometimes we, uh, it's not effective for somebody. And we pre-test it so we know exactly what it's going to do before we prescribe it. In this case, no effect whatsoever. And this happened to be a person that we were treating for seizure disorders, but Omni was not cutting it for this person. Okay. So, again, <clears throat> we're concerned about quieting in the back of the brain. Uh, we're concerned about the sensory motor rhythm and the amplitude of theta right on top here. The, we test the Omni by putting an electrode right up there and turning on the uh, Omni harmonic to see what it does uh, to a theta amplitude. So we always test it before we provide it to anybody. Okay, and then, and right in this region here is where the anterior cingulate gyrus is sitting, and that's the one associated with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, and it also is implicated in uh, the autism aspect that we often find with children with uh, seizure disorders. Now, Mozart, you'll know, you recall that with the child who had the degenerative brain disorder, we uh, used Mozart. Now, Mozart doesn't sound like Mozart. Mozart is just the name of a harmonic that sounds like shh. And within that, we have the cadences and sequences and so forth uh, associated with some of the Mozart uh, uh, compositions. This is what it does to the theta SMR ratio, which again is uh, treatment of choice in many conditions for seizure disorders. Uh, here's where we started off, and the theta SMR ratio was sitting at about 6.8 when the person started. Uh, well, the mean is 6.8. And after exposure to the Mozart harmonic, the uh, uh, seizure, I'm sorry, the theta SMR ratio is now an average of 5.7 or a decrease of about 16%. Now that's simply exposure to a harmonic, okay? So this can be very effective and obviously we don't have any of the chemical side effects associated with the anti-seizure medications. Here's another one. Again, a, uh, a person exposed to, I'm uh, sorry, a person with uh, epilepsy. And this was measured at C4, which is the right side over the sensory motor cortex. And you can see the baseline theta uh, is 14.8. And the, when exposed to Mozart, it's 10.2. The sensory motor rhythm, 5.6 at baseline, 6.3 in exposure to, to Mozart, and a very nice decrease in the sensory motor rhythm, uh, the theta SMR ratio, I should say, okay, 38%. Okay, now, <clears throat> you may recall that the child with West syndrome, we sent the parent home with uh, some uh, procedures to use for home treatment. One is referred to uh, as EFT or emotional freedom technique. And basically what this is, is tapping acupuncture points. 
And these are the ones that are associated with the uh, uh, emotional freedom technique and the one we use for treatment of seizure disorders in which the individual taps very lightly this location, side of the hand. We refer to that as the karate chop point for our young kids. They then go on the inside of the eyebrows bilaterally, tapping both sides. Tap it maybe five or six times. Then the edge of the eye, again bilaterally. Then under the eye, then under the nose, under the chin, under the collarbone, <clears throat> and then under the armpit. We refer to that as the monkey tickle point for our kids. It has a very nice effect on the sensory motor rhythm. And what it does is it increases it. Now, this particular child had epilepsy, 14 years of age, and had serious side effects associated with the anti-seizure medications. Slurred speech, clumsiness, drowsiness. And this is what can happen just by tapping those acupuncture points. Now, we know it's effective because we're measuring the brain activity. There's no guesswork here. When it works, it really works. Uh, here again is another. This is a male child with uh, epilepsy. And here's the EFT. So we get a very nice increase uh, in the sensory motor rhythm and the change in the theta SMR, again, the, the measure of the effectiveness of our treatment and the one that's related to seizure threshold, a very nice decrease of almost 16%. Use of EFT on S on the sensory motor rhythm goes right across all kinds of uh, diagnostic categories. So uh, this is a 10-year-old uh, uh, female child with epilepsy, 38-year-old female with a uh, sleep disorder, 44-year-old male with uh, traumatic brain disorder, uh, a 23-year-old female with depression, sleep disorder, fibromyalgia, again, another epilepsy condition, 12-year-old uh, male with ADD, 23-year-old female with epilepsy, uh, general anxiety disorder, depression, and autism. The average increase in the sensory motor rhythm is about 26%, okay, which is extraordinarily effective. Thank you, Dr. Swingle. This is our second and last break. If you are not on our mailing list, but you would like to be on it, you can email me at rita at swingleandassociates.com. You can see the email address on your screen. And uh, I'll add your name there so you can receive our newsletters and announcements. Uh, for those of you who join us later, we do have three recordings of our previous webcast on our website, which is www.swingleandassociates.com, and you can find these on our media page under the webcast category. Okay. Uh, Dr. Swingle just had to step out for one second. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to tell you a joke that I just found today, just uh, for you to check a little bit. Dr. Smith was the psychiatrist and Dr. Jones was the proctologist. They put up a sign reading, Dr. Smith and Dr. Jones, hysterias and posteriors. The town council was livid and insisted they change it. So the dogs change it to read schizoids and hemorrhoids. This was also not acceptable, so they again changed the sign. Catatonics and high colonics, no go. Next they tried manic depressives and anal retentives, thumbs down again. Then came minds and behinds, still no good. 
another attempt resulted in lost souls and bad holes. Unacceptable again. So they tried analysis and anal cysts. Not a chance. Nuts and butts. No way. Freaks and cheeks. Still no good. Loons and moons. Forget it. Almost at their wit's end, the dogs finally came up with Dr. Smith and Dr. Jones. Odds and ends. Everyone loved it. <laughs> I thought that was a great joke. <laughs> okay, but we do have lots of questions, so let's get straight to it. Uh, is there, Dr. Stengel, is there, oh, just one second here, I lost my screen, there it is. Is there a certain time of day that is best to train to suppress slow frequency? Probably, but in general, uh, I don't concern myself with time of day because uh, what we want to do is we want to uh, get the person so that they can uh, control that their brainwave across the uh, time of day, time of year, and so forth. You'll find that there are changes associated with brainwaves associated with time of day. Uh, all kinds of different things. I just ignore all of that and, and proceed. What do you think is the root cause of the imbalances in the brain that cause seizures? And that's a, a very intriguing qu uh, question. And it's not only with regard to seizures, it's with regard to a lot of things. Uh, there are in general, there are three conditions associated with uh, uh, three uh, causes. One is uh, genetic, in which there is a genetic predisposition to something. Uh, the second is head injury. And the third is experiential. Now, in terms of seizures, uh, the for straightforward garden variety epilepsy, I think it's a genetic condition, and I think it's associated uh, with a, a deficiency uh, in the theta SMR mechanism. Uh, why that's the case, and what the uh, you know why we would have that particular genetic marker uh, is really uh, uh, the we really don't know. We do know that uh, epilepsy and autism share uh, some gene structures. Uh, and uh, individuals that have uh, epilepsy are about 30% uh, more, li I'm sorry, the other way around. Uh, children that have uh, autism are about 30% more likely uh, than the general population to be seizure prone. And thank you, Meredith, for your comment. Uh, besides the fact she likes my jokes, uh, she also says, I'm so impressed by how you have helped different people with seizure disorders. Thank you, Meredith, Meredith for sharing uh, the, your comment with us. Um, another question we have here is uh, from someone in UK. Um, I am EFT practitioner. My seven-year-old daughter has absence epilepsy, and I bought your Omni Harmonic. Can you tell me how how can I use EFT and Omni to decrease my daughter's absence seizures? Sure. Uh, what you do is you turn Omni on before you start the EFT. And keep it very low. Uh, and after it's been playing for oh, maybe 30 seconds or so, then you can start your EFT. Uh, uh, what I uh, want to emphasize for uh, the, all of the folks who are listening is if you're using EFT, you want to tap very, very lightly, uh, something around five grams, which is the weight of a, a nickel uh, in the United States and Canada. That is the coin, five cent coin. It's very, very light. You can also rub as opposed to tap. And what you do is uh, if you're tapping, you tap one location about five or six times and then move to the next lo uh, location. <clears throat> and I do three repetitions uh, for each treatment. And after I'm finished, then I wait about 30 seconds and turn the Omni off. Thank you, Dr. Sengel. We'll have to move on. 
Okay, pseudo seizure disorders. <clears throat> this is an extremely interesting uh, area. Pseudo seizure disorder is the old name, and the one I actually prefer to the new one, which is non epileptic seizures. Seizure disorder, uh, let me go back. Uh, <clears throat> Pseudo seizure disorders are those that have no apparent neurological markers, so that these individuals will go into seizure like behavior. Uh, and even if they're wearing a portable monitor, you do not see any uh, neurological activity that would be associated with the seizure. I mean, you see movement disorders and so forth and so on. But uh, you do not see any of the in, uh, the markers for seizure. <clears throat> now, there's another condition referred to as eclampsia, which is a, a uh, seizure, uh, uh, you know, severe contractions that take place during during uh, delivery of uh, females who have <clears throat> uh, very high uh, blood pressure. Now, uh, we find that eclampsia also responds to theta SMR treatment, uh, even though it's more of a convulsion than uh, a uh, what we would uh, refer to as a seizure. Now, the fundamental issue in pseudo seizure disorder usually is trauma. What we have found, I wrote a paper on this about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, and what we found was that the seizure appeared to be associated with a emo severe emotional trauma, and when that trauma started to emerge, the person would go into seizure mode to protect themselves against the emotional uh, uh, the emotional content, the uh, emotional wave that would come with the uh, emergence of the trauma. Now, uh, you can see trauma when you're, uh, that is the trauma marker when you're doing the EEG. Now, this is a standard EEG, the one that I showed you before. And this is what it kind of should look like, okay? And uh, this is a standard alpha response. Now, that's that same dimension we were looking at before. Now, uh, I'm going to have the person close their eyes, and you're going to see a lot of alpha activity pop up when the person closes their eyes. It'll be right in this region right in here. And that's what you expect. It's referred to as the alpha response. There it is there. Okay, close your eyes. Get a nice jump in alpha. Okay, and when they close their eyes, it should drop like a stone, the alpha blunting response. And it's coming up right around now. And <clears throat> there it is. Okay, so that's the alpha response. Close your eyes, nice rise and uh, strong alpha. Close your eyes, drops like a stone. And here's trauma. Now you can see that it kind of has a look of trying to break through, but can never quite do it. You know, it has a very, very uh, definitive look associated with it. <clears throat> Here is what it looks like in that raw data. Here's where I asked the person to close their eyes, right there. Now that jump in alpha should be at least 30%. It hardly moves. Here's the back of the brain where I ask the person to close their eyes. It should be above 50%. In other words, that number should be at least 12. It went negative. 
<clears throat> where I first discovered that is when I was working with combat veterans over at McLean Hospital when I was at Harvard Medical School. These are the, the people that were hospitalized now for post-traumatic stress disorder. They didn't have an alpha response. It always went negative, which makes infinitely good sense if you think about it, because alpha is a visualization response, <clears throat> and uh, what the brain is doing is kind of trying to protect itself against flashbacks, which is this very serious uh, uh, condition associated with the stress disorder, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, this is what it looks like in terms of if you measure the electrical activity of the skin, which measures autonomic arousal, and this is a person who had pseudo seizure disorders, and this is the uh, activity of one hand and the other hand, and you can see as soon as the arousal level went above, in this case, about five or six micromoles person had a seizure, okay. and the uh, activity was being induced with external tones, and you can see the seizure occurs any time we get the activity going above uh, roughly five or six uh, micromoles. Now, that's what gave rise to my notion that this is a, uh, a, an arousal problem, not an epileptic problem. So in other words, this is if you can help the person deal with the trauma here, you're going to be able to help that person with the pseudo seizure disorder. <clears throat> we I uh, put together a bibliography of <clears throat> the uh, research that's been done on the treatment of seizures. And that's available uh, for uh, anybody if you want it. Uh, just get in touch with Rita. But uh, we get this statement so often. A client will come in and they say, I've been <clears throat> talking to my neurologist, pediatric neurologist, and they tell me this. There's no scientific evidence for neurotherapeutic treatment of epilepsy. Okay, we get this over and over again. So I put together a few pages of references that go back about four decades uh, associated with uh, <clears throat> this treatment, you would think that somebody would be aware of something that's four decades old. I love this quote from George Bernard Shaw. Those who say it can't be done should get out of the way of those who are doing it. Okay, folks, thanks so much for joining us. <clears throat> and. We have professional workshops for those of you who would like to uh, receive some training in neurotherapy. Uh, and again, Rita can help you with uh, the times and locations and so forth. Uh, the Biofeedback Foundation of Europe also puts on courses that teach my methodologies. And you can find out about those folks from uh, biofeedback, uh, bfe.org. And this is the uh, clinician's guide uh, that describes a lot of the uh, methods that I use in the treatment of these conditions. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. And we hope to be with you again on Saturday, August the 13th. Uh, Dr. Singer will talk about neurotherapy and how it can be beneficial to you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.